Kowalski and the Designated Aging and Disability Resource Center. We serve 16 counties in North Central Florida. So we kind of go up to the Florida Georgia line and we touch down near the Tampa and Orlando area and Lake Sumter, Hernando, Citrus County. Um, our home base though is Alachua County. So our um, home office is here in Gainesville, Florida. And uh, we have wonderful partners uh, we work with in each of our 16 counties. Um, we serve seniors, um, adults living with disabilities and their caregivers. Uh, I won't get into all we do, but we have an elder helpline that we serve about, we get about 34,000 calls a year on. We have five full-time um, elder helpline specialists that are constantly answering the phone, trying to help and guide people um, and navigate to resources. Uh, and we also have a lot of direct services, educational support programs that we do. Um, so we, again, thank you for having me and look forward to the panel. Thank you for joining us, Kristen. Joy. Joy, can you hear me? Uh, I'll turn over, I guess. There we go. <laughs> I'm Joy Riddle. I'm a senior vice president over at um, Meridian. My particular is um, marketing, communications, and advancement. So, making sure that um, everybody knows about us and what we have to offer um, and our impacts, as well as securing our resources for the organization um, to be able to continue to move forward. Um, Meridian is the, the largest comprehensive provider of uh, the treatment of mental uh, mental illnesses and substance use disorders in Florida. Yeah. Okay. We um, serve usually well over twenty three thousand individuals each year um, throughout that service area. Um, yeah, I'm glad to be on the call today here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Joy. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, oh, uh, just as a reminder, if you could just mute yourselves because um, so we don't get any of the feedback. Uh, and we, we will be monitoring whenever we go to questions. So we'll be watching for you um, if you want to unmute whenever we get to that. So finally, our uh, last panelist, John. John DeCarmine. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is John DeCarmine. Um, I've got the privilege of leading the team at Grace. And we are a low barrier shelter for people without housing. We also have about 70 units of permanent housing spread around the community. Uh, simply put, we move people without housing into permanent housing every day. Uh, we offer one-stop services so that anybody who needs help doesn't have to bounce around from agency to agency. Instead, they can come to one location. We'll triage them and get them off of the streets and back into housing as quickly as possible. And, uh, Boy, I can't wait to tell you about our whirlwind of a pandemic response, but I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Well, with that, John, we'll, we'll throw the first question at you. Um, I, I think the buzzword this year for all of us, um, uh, especially in the nonprofit sector, has been pivot. Uh, if, I've, if I have said that one time, I think I have said that 10,000 times since uh, February is how um, the sectors had to pivot. So could you describe how your organization had, has, had had to pivot this year due to the pandemic's impact on your programs and services and the impact on those you serve? Sure, so back about 300 years ago when we started our pandemic response, <laughs> it feels like, um, you know, we, we operated, what we really prided ourselves on was having an open campus that's open to anybody who needs help. And when I talk about low barrier services at Grace, that means that we've set up all of our policies to bring in as many people as possible rather than uh, putting requirements in place that say you have to have income or identification or sobriety or, um, you know, references or take mental health medication or anything like that. Our whole goal with the establishment of Grace programs was to make sure we were serving as many people as possible and doing that as effectively as possible. So as we started to understand that the pandemic was, was a thing, was going to not only hit our community, but particularly the people that we serve who are already plagued with an immense amount of uh, underlying health conditions and, and a lot of critical factors that would have made them more vulnerable to the pandemic. We came right up against this narrative happening everywhere that we would all be safer at home. And, and, and to contemplate that as a, as a homeless services provider meant that we were entering a new world because we, we found that 
most programs, most educational messages were all tailored toward just stay home, you'll be safer there, and then we'll all get through this and this will be over. But, but what happens when you don't have a home? And we have people who are living by, by necessity in public spaces, or if they are a grace in one of our 115 shelter beds, then they're in a congregate setting, which is another place that we were being told to avoid wherever possible. So we knew immediately that this was going to hit the homeless community in a disproportionate way. And we, we were trying to find what we could do to, to, well, to pivot, to make sure that we, we met our mission of providing safe shelter and effective services and permanent solutions, but that we did that in a way that got people back into housing quickly. So for us, you know, we started by looking at what was happening in shelters across the country. And when we saw it first pop up in San Francisco, we knew that there were no reported cases in the homeless population. Generally, homeless people were not the ones who were in airports or on cruise ships right before the pandemic started. So it didn't hit the population quickly, but when it hit, it hit very hard. And in San Francisco, we saw shelters go from one case to 73 cases in the course of a week. Uh, we saw the same thing happen in New York, where they went from no reported cases to 300 plus cases in less than a week. And we, without getting too political, we had a real hard time finding meaningful guidance on how we could respond in a way that we felt really preserved the health and safety of people here. So we, we were the first shelter in the community to go into a voluntary lockdown at that point where we were trying to work with people to let them know, look, there's no place for you to go. How can we bring in whatever additional services that you need so that you don't even have to leave the campus? We, uh, we immediately cut off all of our meal groups and our volunteer groups to try to, again, to isolate what was happening to only the people who were on our campus. We implemented uh, a pretty rigorous testing protocol, and that was one of the, the major things that we did early on that I think has been really beneficial. We have had seven confirmed positives at Grace, and we have absolutely, six months into this now, we have no indication that there has been any community spread. We've done that by partnering with UF's mobile medical clinic, with the Emergent Pathogens Institute, and, by, and with uh, folks from the health department who had already been out here in some capacity typically providing volunteer medical services. And to, even today, we have COVID testing on Mondays and on Fridays, and then we do a, a mass testing event uh, every month so that we're, we're still able to test at least half of the people who are out here. Um, for us, it's been a really important lesson in the the in how to really distill our mission down to what the most important part of that is. And, and uh, for those of you I've spoken with before, you'll you'll hear me say two things. There's nothing I hate more than a lazy social worker. And the second thing is that if we as a homeless shelter are not moving people into housing and ending their homelessness, we're not doing our jobs. So so how did we make that work while we were also really trying to manage a 25 acre campus. Uh, I think the, the biggest piece is that we kind of pulled out all the stops and any barrier that existed that was keeping somebody from moving into housing, whether that was a $700 security deposit or um, not having the money to get the ID or the birth certificate that they needed to sign the lease, we just shifted all of our fundraising to cover all of those costs so that nobody was in the shelter who absolutely did not have to be in the shelter. And, and in doing that, we've moved almost, let me see, uh, since the pandemic started, we've moved 191 people into permanent housing. That has come from not only people in our shelter, but also um, early on, we reconciled all of our shelter records with the medical records from the UF Mobile Medical Clinic. We identified who the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable were going to be. And, and basically that boiled down to who was most likely to die if there was an outbreak in our shelter. And then we moved all of those people into a local hotel and began working with them from that hotel to move them into housing. We, in that first month, we housed 26 people in 30 days just coming out of that hotel. And these are some of the folks who were some of the, the hardest to serve among the population. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll stop there. We have a lot of other stuff that we have done ranging from hazard pay for our employees to make sure that they could take care of themselves to providing childcare vouchers because a lot of our employees suddenly found themselves in a pinch where they had no school, they had no childcare and you know, you can't take care of other people if you're not taking care of your team first. But um, I'll stop there and then I'd be happy to answer any other questions down the road, thanks.
Thank you so much, John. That was, that's, that's incredible. Um, Kristen, I know elder options, uh, you guys had to do a, also a major uh, pivot as well. So, to, so tell us how elder options, how you pivoted during the pandemic. Well, um, so luckily I, I say this, that we, we're, we're very lucky that we were looking at Zoom technology prior, about a year prior, and I am so thankful for that because what really happened with us is that we do a lot of um, community education training. We also have a depression management program where we go out and we do six months. We'll work with an individual in home um, to work um, um, through kind of, we do like goals and action plans with them, but we're one-on-one -on -one in their homes. Uh, we do care transition program with UF Health where we assist uh, seniors and caregivers as they're leaving the hospital and discharging home back into the community to be sure that that's a smooth transition and that they have the needed supports and we're meeting their social determinant of health so that they don't readmit back into the hospital and that they are able to successfully stay back out into the community and transition in the community. Um, those services were all being done um, obviously face-to-face -face in home. Uh, or in group settings with educational and training um, out in community centers, senior centers, libraries. So all of that had to stop immediately and we were at a loss. I mean, many of our classes, are, all, actually all of our classes are evidence-based. So they have fidelity and they have set amount of trainings that you have to do and follow your set, um, curriculum. So you might have been four um, classes into a seven class um, a workshop and needing to finish it and everything kind of closed down. So we had to really just immediately try to figure out how could we provide these services virtually. Uh, as I said, a year ago prior to that, we had started using Zoom to do um, partner um, trainings and meetings to save on travel costs for the uh, grants and we're able to have that technology available and start to utilize it. Um, it, it worked well, um, better than we would have expected as far as trying to kind of change the way we were delivering the service. But um, we also realized that there's a whole new set of challenges now because there are a large group of seniors out there that this is not the ideal um, service delivery method for them. So we have been constantly looking at, you know, we've built, developed manuals. We're doing one-on-one -on -one trainings. We work with interns from UF that are um, doing um, individual Zoom trainings with just one to two participants in the Zoom training. Uh, but we're doing well with it. Uh, we also had to institute a telephone reassurance system. We have a lot of seniors that were going to our um, congregate dining sites, our senior centers. Um, they were very active in the community. It's something that our programs over the years definitely have promoted and try to do is, is to help keep seniors active and socially engaged. And all of a sudden, there's just immediate social isolation. When you have this kind of lockdown, especially, I mean, everyone um, was kind of isolated and still to this day are. Uh, so we really have this strong telephone reassurance program and that's helping us to work with them if they want. Sometimes we have certain individuals that want a daily check, right? They want just a daily quick call. A majority of them are about a week or every other week. Um, and then a few people just they just check on me once a month. But we have a real strong program that we've instituted there where we're um, being sure that all of those that we've served are being checked on, even if they're not interested in virtual um, service delivery, they'll do the telephone calls. And then um, we actually had to get all of our staff out working remotely. That was a challenge, but we've moved our elder helpline completely working remotely. Uh, we have set it up with soft phones, accountability. We can see calls, every call that comes in, we can record. Um, so we have that working very well. And we're now moving into what we're trying to implement, which is a new thing is a new, what's called a virtual senior center. So there's some new technology we just received um, some funding for that will be, it's called Uniper, and it actually runs through people's television sets. So as long as they have an HDMI, we can install the box into the HDMI, and then they have a remote that's very simple with a few buttons. They press a button, they'll be able to immediately engage into Uniper, which will have menus of classes and we're working on virtual Zumba, virtual Tai Chi, um, and other, you know, we're just going to try to do um, a lot of different classes. And the last thing I'll say before, you know, I don't want to take up too much time is that we're, we're doing this in conjunction with some other area agencies throughout the state, since there's 11 of us across the state. And we're going to be able to break down those barriers we've always had, where if you um, lived in Alachua County, you would go to your senior center, whatever was programming available here in Alachua County, you'd have access to, right? But we have Broward County and Miami, Miami um, Dade County coming in on this. Also, I think Pasco Pinellas County. 
So when they have their programming, they may have some unique um, programming opportunities that an, a senior in Alachua County will be able to attend. So that's a benefit from the virtual that we'll be able to um, have better access to more variety and a more robust um, you know, um, opportunities to get out of that um, social isolation that they're feeling very much right now. And, and we're really seeing, um, seeing the effects of it. But it's been an interesting thing. I never knew I would Zoom so much in my life, but we do, um, we do rely on it quite a bit. <laughs> so that's what we've been doing. Thank you, Kristen. I, it sounds like I need one of those boxes in my home because I can never get any of my, re, my remotes to work. Um, I love hearing the collaboration, both you, you've mentioned it and John has mentioned it as well, the collaborations that have really kind of evolved through this process. So Joy, let's talk about Meridian. How I know that Meridian's had to pivot as well. T tell us about how, how you've pivoted during this. Yeah, we, um, we definitely did. So from the very first day when it became apparent what was going on as an executive team, we just were 100% adamant that no matter what happened, we didn't care how it went down, we were going to be open and here and available for our patients because they need us. And we also wanted to continue to be a partner and help keep the community whole. So with that, we, in the very beginning, we did I don't know, it felt like our executive team was meeting hourly as the information was coming out. And then, you know, it gradually slowed down to, you know, three hours apart. Um, but we were rewriting medical protocols. We had our medical team together, um, designed all these protocols to try and keep everybody um, safe. And, you know, we have outpatient counseling and prevention and things like that, but we also have acute care. Um, we have residential programs, we have partial hospitalization um, programs, and those people, they, they definitely needed to be here, and virtual wasn't an option for them. Um, now, with that said, on the virtual side, we actually, for probably, I think it's probably about five years now, we have had telehealth virtual strategy in place in our strategic plan as a way to increase access to care. And we've been chipping away at it year after year. And although we were embracing it, the world really wasn't yet. Um, so when the pandemic and the isolation started, that really tipped it um, for us. So we quickly, within a two week period, we scaled up from 30 visits a day to over 400 virtual visits a day. Uh, so it, it went really rapidly. I can't tell you how amazing our IT team is to do that um, because they had to have all those units and everything set up as well as we had to get our counselors and our docs at home. Um, many of our docs for some reason or another are, you know, in a risk category for COVID. Um, so anybody that could work from home, we sent home to work with the appropriate equipment being able to do telehealth and, and still see people. But everybody else that was still here, um, acute care and residential, we partnered with, you know, pretty much everybody. Um, but the health departments and everything else to get screening here regularly. So our populations and our staff can be screened on a regular basis. Um, we, on the on the virtual end, we um, eventually were able to get um, a major gift for some tablets, along with nine months of data each to be able to give out to people. You know, it's great when you have virtual, but when you have people in rural areas or people who don't have a, a smartphone um, and you don't think about the amount of data that it takes to run a, a, a communication like this, so now we're able, um, we took that major gift and we were able to get more funding um, and we still need more um, to be able to get tablets out to all of those people. If you think about seniors that are in bed and you know, small children that can't come in. Um, so one of, the other thing that happens for us is there's an exponential growth in the need for care because the pandemic inherently makes stress and anxiety worse. It makes depression worse. You talk about um, physical isolation. Well, that's about the worst thing that you can do to someone 
who has a substance use disorder or someone that's suffering from depression. You take someone with a substance use disorder and you isolate them and that propels them towards drugs. Uh, so we, we had to deal with all of those things um, and just making sure that we could help everybody. And one of the other things is we're starting to see where we have been for a while, a lot of people that we never saw before. Because, you know, some of them, if you're like me, I, I had stress, I go to Orange Theory, I work out really hard, I get rid of my stress if I had a, a rough day, but um, that doesn't happen for everybody. But then when you take someone who's never struggled before with those types of things, and now you've taken their job away, or, you know, they're, they've lost their mother due to COVID or something like that, we're seeing those people as well. Um, and since this all started, our uh, acute care, our crisis facilities have been sold for adults and children with waiting lists. So, um, and we, we had to shift all of that to make sure that we could just continue, whether it was virtually or internally with medical protocols um, to see people. And I'll, I'll wrap up here because I know I'm talking away. Um, but we, one thing that occurred with, say, our prevention department, who in the very beginning couldn't go do prevention <laughs> anymore because in the beginning you couldn't go anywhere, you couldn't do anything. So we shifted their focus into uh, virtual. So we took our mental health first aid, that's virtual now. And we have a Laura and Mallory series um, episodes that run on social media where they talk about um, things like stress, anxiety, how to deal with it, how to change your behavior patterns. Uh, just, we wanted to put simple stuff that was in small bites out there that could help people to cope. You know, whether it was a fun little video about setting up your home office or how to work from home. Um, so we did that and then we also had to be flexible with our employees because they were struggling as much as everybody else. And I just, I remember, you know, now it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm going to work, whatever. It was kind of terrifying in the beginning, especially when you're coming into a healthcare facility. So we had to put things in place for them um, to help them be able to come to work. So I'll stop there, although I like everybody else to go on forever. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joy. So, so, um, Kristen, I'm going to circle back to you because you, you mentioned it, but I'm going to ask each of you this question. Um, you touched on it, Kristen, and I wanted to explore it a little bit more. So, so what challenges are you still dealing with and what do you perceive will be a long-term issue? So I think the challenges that we're seeing is that we have a whole new group of um, barriers that we're going to have to overcome and what's everything's being done virtually and with everything being done virtually and this is where I want to thank um, you all for the support with the tablets that we received is that um, we have the haves and the haves nots when it comes to who has a device who has wi-fi and if you have that now you have access because we're doing everything virtually but if you don't have that ability you don't have access and you know when i talk about it with um individuals some a lot of people will assume just the rural and i'm like oh no it's not really a rural issue per se it's a it's an economic issue um but it's also can be a rural issue right so um you have individuals that um, even we re we recognize that when we were having our staff go out to remote work that, you know, there's some staff that live in very rural areas and they just couldn't get good internet, right? So that's a challenge. Um, so, but we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we deal with those that one can't either afford the device or Wi-Fi, but want to participate? So how do we create access to them? And really to work with our funding organization, our major one is the Department of Elder Affairs. Um, so we get mostly, all, you know, we get state and federal funding. And there's a lot of rules and regulations. Um, a lot's been relaxed during the COVID um, response, but we know and we're preparing ourselves that the relaxation of those federal and state regulations, they may not continue. And if that doesn't, you know, the, the government's not gonna be too keen on wanting to pay for internet for individuals to have access to services. It's just not something that we think is gonna be a viable option for us in the future. So how do we deal with that if we're gonna continue? Cause I do believe you're going to have to from here forward 
for seniors have some type of a virtual option. They're not going to be running back out after how they've been adversely impacted by this pandemic to say, okay, I feel comfortable again, um, to just start coming back to a senior center where in many cases, some of our centers are small and social distancing wouldn't even be possible, right? So, so we have these challenges that we're, we're looking at. So we're looking at, at that. How do, we, how do we overcome that? Then we have, you know, individuals who just technology is just not their thing. They don't, they can, they can afford it, but they just don't want to learn Zoom. I mean, I had an individual who I'm very close to that just said to me, I don't want to learn it. Quit asking me to learn it. Uh, I just don't, <laughs> and I'm not, I don't, I have, I have enough on my plate right now and I don't feel like learning it. Um, so, you know, how do we deal with that? Um, we're doing a, you know, strategic planning session. We, we're um, starting it this Friday with my senior management team. And I said, guys, we're in a whole new world. It's like wipe the plans off the board and we got a whiteboard in front of us. And we have to think about things um, completely differently. And I really truly believe in long term. So I, I think it's, it's a whole new social isolation um, issue that we're dealing with and, and an access issue that we're dealing with. Um, that's just going to be ongoing. I worry very much about staff. We, we moved everybody out so aggressively to work remotely. Um, I'm challenged right now as you know, the leader of an organization to figure out how do I bring them possibly back in, making sure that the environment's healthy, making sure you know, if we're going to stagger schedule. And emotionally, you've gotten used to working at home, right? Okay, so this is where your comfort zone is. Now we're going to yank you back and say, okay, well, we want you back in the office. And there's a lot of um, stuff, I think, going around dealing with that. Um, so that's an ongoing issue that I, I foresee that we're going to have to deal with. And then getting back in face-to-face. -face, um, you know, our two of our programs that we do go in the homes with our depression management program, PEARLS, and these are, again, evidence-based programs, and there's a real strict fidelity. And then the Care Transition Program, the funders have allowed and the developers have allowed us to do virtually right now because of, again, the COVID pandemic response. But that's not ideally how the model works. And so, you know, that's going to be another um, thing that we're still dealing with is how do we find when are they going to be comfortable, seniors comfortable for us, um, to get back in their homes and how are we going to make that transition back to at least doing some face-to-face. -face. So uh, we're by no means out of the woods. In fact, I feel like we're just kind of just getting through into the woods and now we're like stuck in the middle of the woods and now I'm trying to figure out how do I get out on the other side. Um, and it's a challenge. Um, but what the last thing I will say is it's we're all going through it together. And I've really noticed um, a lot of camaraderie and collaboration around the area agencies and around our provider networks and um, a lot of the um, issues that we might have otherwise had kind of all that's kind of gone to the wayside and we're really just looking at how do we all help each other out and get through it. Thank you so much, Kristen. John. Tell us about the challenges that, uh, that you are still dealing with and what you perceive could be uh, continued long-term issues. So where do I start? I, I, I do, <laughs> I, I think we're very much closer to the beginning of this than we are the end of it, particularly as it relates to human services, um, especially right now for people without housing or people who are somewhat precariously housed or tenuously housed. Um, but I'll start with the very short term. I, I don't even want to say this, but we appear to have dodged the bullet on hurricane season, uh, but we have cold night shelter come up. And I say that because when we, one of the, the, the fundamental functions that Grace provides is if somebody's not already in our shelter, when uh, major weather events come through, people need a place to stay that's not a tent out in the woods or the doorway um, on a street. And when you factor that in with the need to maintain some distance between people, when you, you understand that there's an urgent need to bring as many people inside as you can with the need to say, okay, I need to check your temperature at the door. I'm sorry, do you have the sniffles? Are you coughing? Uh, how are you feeling? You need to now go over here into this potentially symptomatic uh, isolation area. You know, we've, we've planned for all of those contingencies and even if we do okay with hurricane season, we're gonna be dealing with the same thing with cold night shelter in just a couple of months. Uh, we have 
we typically operate four shelter programs. It's a men's program, a men's shelter, a women's shelter. We do a co-ed shelter and a veteran shelter. We have started to, we have also added an isolation facility here and a quarantine facility set up with guidance from the UF Mobile Medical Clinic or the Mobile Outreach Clinic, it's, it's properly called. So we do have some facilities in place, but there are, there are all kinds of things that, that are just new. And you know, you've, you are, you're balancing equations that don't always have a good answer when it comes to who do we allow in and who, what risk do they, are, are they, what are they at risk of versus what risk might they introduce into a congregate area where there are 100 other people. So that's something that we're still negotiating. Uh, I think if anybody can figure out how to do it, it's our community because we do have a lot of great resources and a lot of great people who are really willing to lend their expertise in this. Um, to turn more to the housing side of things, though, I, I think we are just getting started. And, and there are some, I, I am not an alarmist man by nature. I, uh, however, we are in this very interesting position politically where there was a great initial out pouring of support. There, were, there was the CARES Act funding that is both available locally as well as federally. Uh, you know, we're in this spot right now though where we have CARES Act funding that has to be spent by December 31st. And we have an eviction moratorium that doesn't end until January 1st. So we are, we are simultaneously hitting the point where all of the money has to be spent and then all of the problem starts literally the next day. And, and that eviction moratorium is, is a moratorium, I think, in name alone, because it doesn't say, it does not say that somebody will not be evicted uh, throughout this pandemic. What it says is come January 1st, a whole lot of landlords who, who have a, a vested interest in collecting rent are going to say, great news, you are welcome to continue your lease. You just happen to owe me $6,000 in back rent. And as soon as you pay that, we'll accept your rent for the following month. And that's going to be a major issue. Um, that we, we are working with Barzella, with the county, to see if there are ways that we can deal with back rent while there is still this influx of CARES Act funding. But it's, it's, going, to, it's going to be a real community effort to find ways, not even to prevent the worst from happening, but to mitigate that to every possible extent. Um, with with that, you know, we, we've seen that in a couple of different circumstances where everyone is very interested in this right now. I hope that we don't end up in a spot where we move on or we somehow believe that the pandemic is over when the, the, the economic pandemic is just going to be beginning. Because for us, that's going to be very, very real. And when you look at some of the National Housing Organization's numbers, there are some uh, some estimates from some well-respected institutes that say that up to 43% of renter households could end up evicted as a result of this. In Alachua County, that translates to 19,000 people who would be at risk of eviction when this eviction moratorium ends. By comparison, we on a daily basis have roughly 750 to 800 people without housing. So we are looking at a 20-fold increase, uh, the potential for a 20-fold increase if we do not recognize that this is coming and take the appropriate ste steps at this point. Thank you so much, John. Yes, and we, we are, we, we're trying to keep our ear very close to this issue as well. So thank you for that. Joy, let's see. Oh. What are, what, are the, what are the challenges that y'all are still dealing with and anticipated long-term issues? Yeah, so some of the things I already talked about that we're dealing with, it, um, you know, the crisis stabilization units being filled, um, children having more issues, um, more people with depression, anxiety, um, people, new people to that, old people to that, um, and along with everything else with the funding and jobs and the things that everybody else is talking about is the need for uninsured and indigent care. So we're serving a greater number of people that are both acute and new additional people for anxiety and depression. Um, and access is great, we're bringing them in, but it requires funding. You know, and that doesn't exist in the degree needed. So the need for treatment is outpacing the need for funding. And our um, indigent care uh, 
two fiscal years ago was a little under um, a half a million dollars. And I'd have to check the number for sure, but we were, last time I checked before the last fiscal year closed out, we were on track to hit 3.1 million. Um, so it, it's, yeah, it's getting, um, you know, really bad out there. You know, lots of people are saying that mental illness is the next pandemic. Um, that's that's what's coming. Suicide ideation rates are rising, depression and anxiety. So um, in a nutshell, funding to make sure that we can serve everybody that needs it is the challenge. We've kind of just been taking people in and taking people in. And as we all know, that's not sustainable. It's you know, <laughs> so, yep, that's it. So, Joy, I know you just mentioned funding, and mm -hmm. we have a, a lot of members of the, the circle here with us today. So, uh, mm -hmm. and I know that they would love to hear, how did the grant that you received from the Giving Circle impact your organization and those that you, you serve? Yeah, so um, the Giving Circle grant, which we greatly appreciate, um, was a, a, a wonderful gift that allowed us to do something that um, Laura Holly, our director of Pre prevention, was wanting to do for a really long time. Um, and now with a pandemic that wasn't letting her out in the public and funding um, from the Women's Giving Circle, we were able to launch the online coffee chats. So it's a support and educational virtual every Thursday morning at eight o'clock place for moms and female caregivers to get together. Um, and, you know, we've partnered with a lot of different people on that as far as like um, through participants, through the PTA, um, Alachua County, um, just a lot of different aspects that gave us the ability to partner with. But one of the really cool things or two really cool things um, that came out of it, and I asked Laura this, um, this morning, hey, what are the two best things that happened so far as we're just going into the second set of sessions now? And she said, well, the first one was there's um, someone who's very involved with the PTAs in Alachua County, this is, that um, is very interested. And now they are working with us to put together this plan to reach through all the PTAs in Alachua County um, to, I think, 5,000 members plus students to be able to give them resources and tools um, and work with them and you know, be able to provide those types of things. So we're super excited, not only about the people we've been able to impact directly, but now there's this exponential growth and opportunity that came out of it. So that's um, really exciting. And then uh, Laura told me that on an individual scale, um, the participants of the groups feels, are reporting feeling supported and connected. They're learning more about themselves. And this happened unintentionally, but in the first round of, um, of sessions, the participants um, were moms that have children with special needs, which was not targeted, which was not intentional, but the majority of them were moms that had children with spe special needs. So being able to reach that group that we hadn't been necessarily before and connecting with them um, has been a significant success that we're so appreciative of you guys um, for that. So, uh, yeah, and then it's another way to introduce people to Meridian, um, and we talk about the Women's Giving Circle. But So some people that wouldn't necessarily come to us for service now do. Yeah, and we're really excited about the growth and the plan with the school system in Alachua County. That is fantastic. Thank you so yeah. much for that update. Yeah. So, Kristen, oh, yeah. I, know, I know, Kristen, you talked about access, and I know the Giving Circle grant uh, was targeted for access for your seniors. So can, mm -hmm. can you share with uh, the Giving Circle members today how, um, uh, how that grant really helped uh, impact your program? Uh, yes, I will. So thank you. Um, 
Well, we really appreciate the support. What we were trying to do is, as everyone was, when we realized everything's going virtual, we were identifying individuals, especially that were currently in our programs that didn't have the ability to continue with some of the programming that we were doing, or the workshops they were in because they didn't have access. So we knew that was a problem right away and we worked with you all. Um, it was such a quick response. And I, I have to tell you, you know, we go around on, we have a statewide call that we all talk into the Department of Elder Affairs and we let them know, you know, kind of what's going on in our area. When I let, I told them we had received this grant so quickly, they were really impressed at how supportive this community is at that there was somebody there and willing to do it. Um, so we could go ahead and get the technology that we needed. We purchased um, some tablets. What we decided we were going back and forth was, you know, you know, really that we need to have, let them have internet in them because um, most of the people we found that were unable to access or didn't have the device were also unable with, um, didn't have the Wi-Fi or the ability to pay or uh, have access to Wi-Fi. So we got the tablets and we created a, kind of a tablet lending library. Um, so with the money, we were able to get uh, 15 of them that are equipped with um, a Wi-Fi service. So when they lend it out, they actually have the Wi-Fi service in, in it and built in and it's being paid for by us. So they don't have to worry about that. We configured the tablet so that the, um, the, the front page is just extremely user friendly and we got rid of the ability to, to uh, we limited some ability to, you know, they can still get on the internet, but there are certain sites and things they can't get to because we, because it's a lending library that we're trying out, they'll get them for six months and then they'll have to trade them, you know, in. Um, and so we want to be sure that we had some limitations to what was a, they were able to be used for. Um, and because um, what we're worried about and what we're waiting to see, which we haven't seen too much of a problem yet, is, is how much um, administration will be on us with user issues on the tablets. That, that's going to be, you know, kind of a challenge that we're, we're preparing ourselves for. But um, what we do is we have different programs. So we have, um, I told you there's uh, some seven-week series, some eight-week series. We have um, created a new one that's trying to help um, seniors be active. It's an evidence-based, it's called Bingo Size. So they're actually doing healthy exercises and learning healthy eating habits, but while they're doing something familiar in lots of times is a bingo. And they win after so many um, sessions of it. We have a couple week sessions and then a gift card will be sent out to them. We have um, Tai Chi classes, as I was talking about, those are again, evidence-based. Uh, we have some chronic disease self-management classes, teaching people how to manage chronic diseases, um, diabetes education classes. We have our Savvy Caregiver program, which is to help uh, caregivers who are caring with people with dementia, just to, to, to kind of learn about the disease, learn about the journey, understand how to, to deal with it, their loved one. And so that class is extremely popular. We're bringing in a new one called Coping with Caregiving. And we're also um, providing these if, if there's people who want to attend. We have a virtual support groups that have been really successful. Um, what we found is that we are doing our support groups now that we don't need a physical location more in the evenings than on the weekends. And it's allowing caregivers who didn't normally other times be able to participate, participate. So they get these tablets and then a part of it is that there is an agreement when they receive it that they will engage in some of these activities, right? So that they're going to engage in some of the programming we provide. Uh, we ask that they do at least two, two of the trainings or workshops within the six month period. Um, we, are, we have reserved five of them for our depression management program, PEARLS, because we think it's so important that they coach see the individual as we're going through that program. You know, we, are, we still follow the fidelity in the cur curriculum um, when we're doing it telephonically, but, but we've, we've noticed it's much better when we can do Zoom. So five of them have been set aside and are being used with um, individuals in that program that have been identified with mild to moderate dep depression, um, that we provide that and um, but so far it's been great. We, we're, you know, we're just getting into this and we're learning, like I said, there hasn't been what we expected to be maybe some user issues we haven't seen as much. We will then, when the six months over, we will trade them in and we will find other individuals who can then engage in our programming. The last thing I'll say is we did submit another grant to the Florida Blue Foundation um, that we're hoping to, um, to get that will expand on this. And we're calling the program Passport to Wellness where we will try to get groups of seniors. Um, and the idea of the passport is there'll be like a, a passport model where they'll have like where they can, when they go through different classes together, they'll get kind of a stamp. 
Um, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll put them together in groups of like 10 or less that will participate in some of these activities together so that they can build relationships virtually with the other individuals as they go through a set of workshops. Some will be what we normally do, our evidence-based education, and some we're going to do more fun classes where we're, we're, we're going to engage in maybe like a cooking class or we'll go visit a museum together and then take advantage of some of the virtual tours that are online. Um, with the idea that um, these groups that, of seniors that may not know each other at the end of it will um, know each other, you know, closer and have built bonds along with learn some things that we hope will help them and keep them engaged. So we're looking to that and if we receive that, that will, um, will also maybe weave into this lending library. That's fantastic. Thank you for that update. John, I know we, we, um, we, Kristen mentioned how quick we were to respond. And I know the other thing we, we've, we've really tried to be flexible and I know, uh, so give, get us up to speed on how the Giving Circle grant impacted Grace. Sure, um, and more, more so than Grace, it, it impacted the women that we serve in ways that no other, no other funding sources allowed us to do. So, so just to start with the background of it, uh, thanks to the Women's Giving Circle, there are 19 women who had been homeless, living on the street or living in the shelter, who are in housing of their own tonight. Um, that in and of itself is absolutely incredible. But it, I can say with absolutely without reservation, the, the funds from the Women's Giving Circle were simply put the most impactful dollars that we have received during the pandemic, uh, delivered at exactly the right time and, and very specifically delivered in exactly the right way. Um, you know, I think one of the ways that our community does does philanthropy really well is that we recognize that there are some types of agencies and organizations and institutions built for certain types of work, and um, we have a lot of experts that we can count on. So when the Women's Giving Circle granted us $10,000 and just said, do what you think is best with this, we knew that we would be able to use that funding flexibly to get women in, in all kinds of different situations. So. Uh, not only did we get 19 women into housing, but more than half of those women, 11, were went from homeless to housed in less than a week. And that is entirely due to the flexibility of the funding. You know, as, as, as a nonprofit director, and I'm sure Joy and Kristen can attest to this, there, there are, I, I can chase all kinds of grants that will give us $10,000 for $12,000 worth of paperwork. Um, or, you know, $10,000 for, for $9,000 worth of paperwork and you think you're coming out ahead because you made $1,000 to put towards your programs and services. Um, and and it's, it's, it doesn't let us do what we do best, which is move people into housing. So when we got the funding from the Women's Giving Circle, we, we immediately started to apply it to, we had a woman living in our parking lot. She had shown up the day before. She had a job. She just couldn't afford first month, last month and security deposit. We were able to get her housed that next day. Uh, we had a similar situation happen with another woman. We helped women in shelter pay for application fees so that they otherwise could not have afforded. We put it toward a program that we have called Diversion. And, and what that is, it's, it's rooted around the idea that people have more resources than they may know that they have. And I, I used to think that this program, that the, the concept of Diversion was, was kind of a was not all it was cracked up to be, you know, on the logic that why in the world would somebody show up to a homeless shelter unless they truly had no other option. At Grace, what we have found is if we ask the right questions at the right time and in the right way, one out of every four people who shows up here saying, I have no alternative but to be at Grace can actually be connected with friends or family or a coworker or, you know, a high school friend or, or some other safe situation that not only ends their immediate housing crisis, but it also preserves a shelter bed that they would have filled for somebody who shows up next and truly has no other alternative. So for us to have been able to, to have been trusted with these funds to apply them in the way that worked best for 19 individual sets of circumstances was absolutely the most effective, most helpful, uh, most impactful thing that we have had the privilege of doing during the pandemic. Um, we were, I want to just make a, a note, we were able to leverage that funding as well. So 100% uh, of those women are still housed right now. And we have been able to tie those funds toward, into other grants that we have. So we've leveraged that against some federal funding from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. 
some ESG CV funding, which I don't expect anybody else knows or wants to know what those are, but just the, the, the CARES Act dollars and some local dollars so that we've in, been able to put in place uh, one staff member who actually is still following up with those women on a regular basis. So that's once a week, we just swing by the house, make sure everything is still going well, make sure that if there's a potential housing crisis down the road, we know about it a month in advance instead of hours in advance. So it's not only allowed us to do really great work, but in fact, that has reduced the population of homeless women by about 9% in Alachua County just over the past six months. Wow, thank you so much, John. Thank you. Uh, well, we have just a few minutes left here. I, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time um, and, and, and be sure to wrap up on time. But um, so um, I know Leslie's gonna be my eyes to see if anybody has a question or two. I think we have time for one or two.